Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Good afternoon, Think Tech Hawaii. Hey, and we have some wonderful people with us today. We have retired Hawaii judge Sandra Sims and noted author of The View from the Bench. We have David Larson, not only one of the leading professors in law and dispute resolution at Mitchell Hamlin in St. Paul, but also a leading expert on bringing access to justice and online case resolution to the courts in New York and hopefully elsewhere. And Tina Patterson, mediator, arbitrator, entrepreneur, and coach from Germantown, Maryland. Diverse group, very insightful group. And while we were waiting, we were talking a little bit about one of the most pitched battles between resilience and resistance in our society now is over healthcare, vaccines, masks, treatments. Hey, Sandra, your thoughts? Where are we going wrong? It's a very different time. It's a very different kind of discussion. I think you have a very different um, public perception of what the roles of public health uh, are for society, for our society. And then we have this, this other part of it to me, I think, which has been occurring over a period of time, this sort of a delegitimizing de de the value of science and education as well. Um, uh, in many of our um, you know, public school systems, we're not treating education in the same way that we, or valuing it in the same way that we've previously done. Uh, we can kind of look around and see how that many of our um, <clears throat> major universities on the world stage, and, and David, you probably know this better than, than I do, have sort of lost some of their statue as valued institutions. Um, they're not, the, you know, there was a time, it, it felt like there was a time when more people craved the value of American education because our education system was deemed to be pretty much superior to much of the world. That's not always the case now. Um, maybe certain in some of our elite universities, that's still the case, but um, in many places it's not. And in our communities, that's also affecting how we view science and how we respond to, you know, to professional information that comes to us that we don't, that we don't that we're not necessarily expert at. Now, in other words, rather than listening, we're just sort of everybody has an opinion, so to speak. And social media technology lets you express your opinion. However, however uh, um, uninformed it may be. And we have that. Tina, David? Well, you know, we've had, a, we've had um, some leaders and currently have some leaders who profess to, along the lines of what Sandra's saying, to not really pay attention to science and literature, but to go with their gut. And their guts, the, their gut, is, is kind of the best guide as to what policy should be. And, you know, I think that's just dangerous. That's it, my feeling is we're entering a period where we're kind of moving back towards the dark ages where we're rejecting um, science and information and data. And we're going back towards emotional responsible mm -hmm. responses to different circumstances and things. And I think that's dangerous. David, I, I have to concur with you. I would, when you first posed the question, Chuck, I thought about public health and I thought about the role of leaders appointed, elected, and upholding public health for the greater good of the community, not for one or two individuals or not because it's profit making, but because for the greater good, we need to wash our hands or boil our water. And I use those two as examples because for a while, those were things that were not considered public health necessary, but they are necessary. What I'm seeing or what I'm witnessing is this division where what's gonna garner votes, what's gonna curry favor. 
Um, we have in some states, I, I talked with a, a colleague last night who told me the state where he resides, the governor has filed an injunction so that a local municipality can have their mandate for wearing masks lifted because he doesn't agree with it. Mm -hmm. So you've got a, a, a metropolitan area of millions of people and you've got this battle between two elected officials when the public health crisis isn't a matter of Democrat versus Republican. It's what is, go what is going to save the most lives? What is, again, back to the greater good. And I, this seems to be playing out over and over and over again. I know in the business community, some businesses are saying, you know what, we'll come back in 2022. We're making profits and our people are healthy working from home. I understand that there's frontline workers who have to go in, but I think we're, we're, we're losing the message, which is public health. Um, before we started the show, we talked about measles, polio. There's been other um, diseases that have been global. And again, it was back to public health. How do we save as many lives as possible? And that message seems to just be drowned out with other agendas. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. Yeah, the On idea the other of, side, go ahead. Okay. I was gonna say the idea of the whole notion of public and what that word means has basically lost its lost its strength, lost its value. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, now it's now the emphasis on private. Um, you know, what what does all of this mean to me? You know, how is this impacting me? What do I want to do? Um, this whole idea that public health means that we aren't particularly concerned with you at the moment because we are looking at a pandemic. We're looking at catastrophic consequences. You know, there are moments in time when we're going to be a little less concerned about what you believe your private rights are for the benefit of saving lives. Yeah. Look at all the things going on. You've got governors in several states who exactly for the reasons you just outlined saying uh, our votes are with people who are anti-mask and pro-gun. They're it's our right to do this, it's our right to do that, regardless of the public interest and the public health. You've got school districts and schools who are saying we have a responsibility to our teachers and our children and our people, and we're going to protect them. So we are going to require masks. And we now have battles going on at all levels uh -huh. between political leaders and community leaders over the public health of employees, of children, of public space users. I don't think we've ever seen anything like this. Certainly never happened with the polio vaccines, with smallpox, with yeah. measles, with any of those things. What makes this so different? What makes this so susceptible? to that kind of politicization and division. So, Tina, we were talking before the broadcast, and I think Tina made a really astute observation that, um, and I think maybe both Sandra and Tuna were, uh, Tina were talking about this, but in the early stages of the COVID, um, the results of the disease seem to be centered on older, older individuals, um, not even middle-aged adults, but older adults, and it didn't seem to be didn't seem to be affecting children very much, and uh, you know with this new Delta variant, and we're talking now about Lambda variant and other variants, they seem to be affecting kids much more significantly. Uh -huh. And you know they both made the observation that when you start affecting children, that maybe grabs people's attention in ways that we haven't been able to up until now, and. So one difference, I think, is that when we think about other public health crises in the past, they often did involve children who risked Thank kind you. of a lifetime of disability, and we didn't want that to happen. And that wasn't in the, in the calculus um, up until now, but I think that's happening now. And if you look mm -hmm. around the country, those statistics for kids are starting to take off, and, and hopefully that will get enough people's attention that maybe they'll change their behavior. Yeah. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I think, Chris, and, and, and here we just started, um, our schools just went back, public schools just went back last week and they were going back to uh, in-person learning. Um, they have the option of, you know, doing online. But again, you're seeing far, far more parents and people within that, you know, people who have children who are really, really having more of a stance. That's another dilemma. It's because on the other hand, what's happened in education is that the year of online education for many kids has been disastrous. Um, they've fallen way, way behind. They've not been able to develop the skills that we normally associate with with childhood education. It is it's certainly the you know the uh, technical skills, the, you know the readings, but it's also the socialization kinds of skills that are an important part of education. COVID took that away. Took it away. We've got a whole year. We've got a whole bunch of kids that are, you know, coming out of this situation. Um, many and 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 also adding to that the trauma of it as well yeah. for children. So that's another piece of it in terms of you know where this resistance and and discussion is taking place is because kids were we, we have to acknowledge the trauma that they experienced during this time as well. Um, not being you know we 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 sort of make fun, not make fun, but we sort of minimize the importance of children's interactions with other children, um, you know, with the developing of their friendships and those socialization skills. It's a key piece of education um, in the early, you know, in those early ages. And that's, it's, it's kind of gone uh, for many of them. And so that impact, that's another piece of the impact that I think will help Maybe it'll be helpful then for you know, people responding to these times and maybe seeing it in a different way because it affects children. You know, I think, you know, I think kids are kids are really adaptable. Um, at least that's been my experience yeah. with kids that, you know, you ask a kid to wear a mask and pretty soon they're fine wearing a mask. Um, yeah. What's more important is them being together and being able to play. So yes. I, I agree that that kids lost a lot and they lost a lot in terms of socialization and getting them back together is really important, but we want to do it as wisely and intelligently as we can. And, you know, that kind of additional part of requiring masks when they get back together, I don't think it should be such a great deterrent because no. you know, at least from what my perspective, the thing that is most destructive is the isolation when everybody, yes. everybody's home and not seeing each other. So if we can exactly. get them back together, but get them back together as safely as possible, we've, we've overcome one of the greatest um, losses of, of COVID, which is that, that isolation. Uh -huh. But we have to do it wisely. Yeah. No, yeah, kids can, they'll adapt. But like you say, they'll do what they need to. But I mean, it's- well, the, And we also know this is hitting the most vulnerable kids and families the hardest. That part too. Those that with the least too. resources, those the least able to deal with it. Yes. Uh, the ones where fathers and mothers are losing jobs, uh, where they're at risk of losing their homes, whether rental or own, uh, where the kids aren't able to adapt to the home learning. They don't have the resources. They don't have the right. Support. They don't have the yeah. Yeah. And kids learn with and from each other. Yes. And that's always been a really key part of the system. And one of the things that the best teachers do really well, they reinforce that mutual collaborative learning that kids do. And so another thing that may seem to be going on here is not only extremely high distrust of government, if they say there's a pandemic, you got to do this, you got to do that, a high distrust of the government related medical institutions, uh, but of institutions generally, whether they're schools or others. Mm -hmm. So where did that come from? How did we get to this place? If you look at it historically, and you see some of the differences in how our society gets its information and communicates now compared to 
the times when we were growing up and polio and smallpox and other smallpox and other vaccines were considered unquestioned public health resources and benefits. We now have central means of communication being used for exactly that division, for exactly that misinformation, for exactly that mistrust of leadership and of government. Yeah. How we turn that around. Well, you know, we've had kind of a, a cadre of public of recent politicians who've been successful in their claim that they're not they're not politicians. They're coming from the outside. That they're going to reject all the traditional institutions, um, and they've kind of leveraged that, um, and it's been successful for them. So you know, they're going to stay. They're going to stay loyal to the type, and you know I, I you know I'm contra institution. I'm I'm contra government, and consequently, um, I think we should question and reject things that perhaps we've accepted in the past because um, because I don't think it's gotten to the place we want to be, and I, I think that idea that that because I because I'm not a traditional politician and I don't represent traditional values, and you know come follow me. I think people have followed that um, to their detriment. That um, uh -huh. it's almost blind, it's almost blind allegiance. Yeah, yeah. I see that. I see that. I see that. So what's ahead? I think part of what's ahead is looking at how information is disseminated. I was thinking about what David and Sandra were saying regarding um, the mess messaging and how how we message. Um, and I know there's people who wish social media will go away. I don't see it going away, but I do see us taking a closer lens at, at, at the need to know and how how we find out information, whether that is through our phone or through a social media site how 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 it's curated or how it's not curated and and i don't want to call it truth and information because that brings up a whole nother but literally how do we disseminate the things that we've seen happen in the past 20 years with the advent of social media are things that in the past we would have known about 10 hours later 12 hours later a day later and now we know sometimes within minutes hours um it's it's that advent of dis disseminating information, whether it's true or untrue, that I think we'll be looking at more closely. And and how do we get the message out? And I'm going to use the example of washing your hands. How do we get the message out? Oh, you need to wash your hands. You need to wash your hands for 26 seconds. There's a reason. You know, if you want to recite your ABCs or the um, Roman alphabet while you do it, fine. But there's a reason. And right now we get everything from um, the sublime to the complete fantasy just thrown at us and trying to, to make sense of what's, what's true, what's not true, what's really fanciful or being made up to, to carry a story forward becomes more and more of a challenge for us. Um, you know, and I'll use the, the example of, well, I'll use the example of Clorox. I'm sure they're not happy about me saying this, but the whole the idea that you know you should use basically um, cleaning solution to address COVID. Um, you know, there's some who, and I'm with some of my colleagues. You hear that and you think there's a there's that symbol on the back of it that tells you this is poison. So how do you think this is going to work? And then there's others who say, well, you know, if Chuck says it, then it must be right. And it's that examination that we, I think, will be looking at more closely. Just because Chuck said it doesn't make it true. And where does common sense step into this conversation where you see, you know, there's a, on the back of it, if ingested, contact the National Poison Center. 
that yeah you know I, and i think Sorry, schools Jeff. are beginning to do this um you know but but we have to kind of refocus on critical thinking and teaching critical thinking and yeah we're talking about the distribution of information through all these different channels you know to step back and and just say okay let's let's talk about how you learned about what happened yesterday let's have a conversation about that you know and do that in our schools and talk to the kids and say that okay um did you believe that did, didn't you believe it why did you believe it and begin to have them think a little more thoroughly about sources of information and where it's coming from or whether it's reliable and i think i think we can do that i mean i think we can improve our critical thinking and our ability to to teach people to be a little more skeptical about what they hear on first impression and to to look a little more deeply is that is that happening more or less i mean i'm not i'm not a teacher i'm not in, in involved in so much education so, but that is a question that i think is an important way for for young when i say i don't want to say kids but young people uh is to be able to, to do that. And I'm not sure if that if that skill is as developed. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, like even in the high school, middle school, high school, and even some college level. I mean, I've, I've taught a few classes at, as an adjunct lecturer and some of that kind of critical thinking is just not there. Uh, no, I, yeah, I'm not. I'm and not I'm not. Sure. I'm not sure I'm, it's being done. Um, I'm just. Yeah, and, and well, kind of I, about but, it, but it, and, yeah, and that was kind of one of the things that I picked up during that time period. It was kind of concerning that, you know, the way you get information, the way you, you know, dispense information, what you hold as truths, uh, was was a uh, was a bit disturbing. It really actually was to me a, a bit disturbing because I don't see that uh, happening as much. I remember a class I. Uh, this is digressing, but I had them to do um, to watch the movie Marshall, uh, the movie about Thurgood Marshall. This is in a criminal justice class. And one of the things I mentioned, I had some questions posed about things about him, not in the movie, but for them to find out. And, you know, going to the question of why didn't he go to the University of Maryland Law School when he applied? Um, <laughs> And they came back and, you know, it was like they were just stunned to understand what happened and why he could not go to that school because they didn't allow blacks to go. But simple things like, I mean, that seems simple to me, but but these are college students. Who didn't understand these sort of critical pieces of our history that that because that's that that wasn't that long ago in terms of. No, it wasn't. And yeah, so we, and when they learned, when we had, when they found that out, it was like, it sort of sparked some more discussions about other things that they'd sort of just taken for granted. Yeah, you're just supposed to do these things and it's supposed to happen. It's like, wait a minute, there's some barriers here. There's some barriers that exist and we need to be more aware of them. Uh, and it sparked a whole, whole discussion. So, so Chuck was kind of asking, what's the way out? And I'm not sure it's being done. I, I, I'd like to think it's being done, but I think it is a way out is to really is. emphasize critical thinking. Um, uh, I think we can do that. Uh, and that perhaps is a way to, a way, a path out of this. So I can share some insight with you since I recently obtained my master's degree. Um, critical thinking is discussed, but it's not discussed with frequency. It's not discussed as a wholesale topic. Um, it, the thought or um, critical thinking is usually taught for people who are in philosophy or other majors where you are literally looking at something for arc for the sake of argument. And I would like to put forth that critical thinking doesn't necessarily mean that you're arguing with someone. It simply right. means that you are looking what's in front of you and does it, does it ring true? Does mm -hmm. it make sense? Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is where it kind of gets lost that it's a stuffy topic. It's actually, for me, I'm actually taking a course now on critical thinking because I feel like I, 
it, it wasn't emphasized enough. Okay. And you okay. know whether it's the the reporting of a, an event and how you think you saw something and you report it, you're confident, but the the reality is it didn't happen exactly as you said. It's not because you're lying, but because when when the critical thinking sets in or you start cr critically thinking about what transpired, some pieces of what you're saying just don't make sense. Um, and part of it is physiologically, our brains do things. We, we, we think we saw something, then we didn't. But when we delve into critical thinking at that level, people usually get the, are you done yet? Versus the, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the simple yeah. question, like you said, Sandra, you know, why didn't Thurgood Marshall go to the University of Maryland? And why did he end up at Howard? And it, that's the fact that, it, you know, the fact is University of Maryland Law School didn't admit black students back then. And he opted to go to Howard. Um, but he sued him later, but that was yes, he did. But <laughs> that was the fun part. <laughs> but but it's that taking a no, moment no, no, to kidding. pause and analyze. And, yeah. and in a world where, and I hate to sound negative about this, instant gratification. Sandra, I really, I, you know, can you just give me the answer? Can I just Google it and get the answer? Can you yeah, just tell I, me? Yeah, I, 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 didn't I don't want to think that. about it. I didn't <laughs> exactly. allow that. <laughs> exactly. See, and that's they why you got multiple choice exams. I was like, no, 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 no. You're not. Gonna, we don't do yeah. multiple choice Give exams. Give it to me quick and, and fast. Just, you got to tell me what's. You know, you got to. I don't. Know, maybe I think it's the, the the lawyer in us that sort of sort of makes you do that, but. That is the way. I mean, people just, you know, you have, you can have a discussion with someone and my own kids do this. And rather than discuss something, I'll just pull up the phone and like, let's just Google it. Here's the answer. There it is. Instant Boom, we're done. Let's move along. Yeah. <laughs> In instant gratification. Just give me the answer. Give Siri, the answer. what's the we're answer? Done. We don't have to Google, talk about what's it. what's the answer? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, you know, you want me to look at what? And uh, that's going to take that's going to take longer than I really wanted to put into this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I going back to your earlier question, Chuck, I do think it's the advent of the super information. You know, I can type in the word. Avocado fries and get five different recipes at, at once on my computer and make a decision about which of those recipes I want to follow. And some of them may be good. Some of them may not be good, but. It's quick. It's fast. I've got an answer. May, is it the best answer? That remains to be seen, but I got it. We but know people are going to look for yeah, is. the answers that they want to hear. And if they don't right. hear them one place, they'll keep looking until they find a place. And then they'll pick that and rely on that. Mm -hmm. So we've run out of time for today, but we're at a point where if there's anything that maybe pulls this all together, it's that taking learning in a truth-seeking public safety direction is something that we're going to have to do together, multi-generational, multidisciplinary. We're going to have to team up, not divided, fighting each other about it, Absolutely. but engaging in it together respectfully Absolutely. and understandably. Absolutely. Hold that thought and come back with us in a couple of weeks and we'll see where it goes from here. Thanks so much for joining us. Think Tech Hawaii, Tina, Sandra, David, thank you so much for your insights and wisdom. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you. Bye.